Now here we have a piece of bronze statuary, also Greek, and it's remarkably well preserved given the fact that it was actually cast more than uh, 450 years before the birth of Christ, uh, over 2,000 years ago. A lot of the statuary of this type doesn't exist anymore because as time progressed and the Roman Empire came and went and the uh, civilization entered the Dark Ages, the arts of working metal in this way were lost. Many times Greek statuary like this that was cast in bronze were melted down. They were melted down to make weapons or to use the metal for other purposes because people had lost touch with the technologies and the techniques of actually mining and smelting metal like this. So it was a terrible recycling of the metal that was was in these statues. Another reason that these statues, many of them don't exist, is that uh, as the Christian era came in, Many times uh, zealous Christians would think that these were pagan statues and they should be destroyed. The reason this is preserved is it was found under a bunch of rubble and dirt and it was probably just missed in one of these recyclings or one of these uh, statuary destruction efforts. Now notice here the eyes are actually stones that were polished in this way and so they look rather realistic. Bronze is tough to work with. You don't carve this directly. What you have to do is you carve some sort of a a wooden model like this or plaster model and then you make a sand mold that's two-faced so that it can be opened up and then you pour melted bronze in here and if everything goes right when the metal hardens up you then have the shape and you pull the sand away and that accounts for kind of a rough surface to it although this would have been much more polished at the time. So the Greeks learned how to work in metal in this way and they applied the same artistic uh, style and the same artistic talents to the original mold here as they otherwise did with stone directly. And here, Discobolos, from around 450 BC, one of the finest pieces of Greek sculpture that has ever been located. It's very interesting how all of the muscles and the ribs and the muscles of the arms and even this vein of the arm here has been captured by the sculpture. A lot of very subtle detail here. And even today, people who are interested in hurling a discus, which is this, look at a statue like this and think that this is the correct position as used by the Greeks in order to hurl that thing. Another thing that makes this really remarkable is the way that the Greeks had to work with the limitations of stone. This is the figure of a man, but really it started out as a piece of stone. And as stone, it's got weight. This is solid stone here and it weighs a lot. This arm extended, you can see it's broken here at some point, because it's rather fragile. This is a lot of weight and stone is not very good at supporting weight that's cantilevered out like this. So this was a natural break point and at some point that arm did break off and it's been fastened back on. But here, the weight of this body resting on this narrow amount of stone here and here, the sculpture who designed this had to put in something here to also support. That's the reason for this kind of a stump of a tree back there. The fact that they could do this and still make this look very natural was a great accomplishment. Once the Greek, the Greek civilization passed from the scene, the art of doing this sort of sculpture was lost. And it was lost for almost uh, 2,000 years from 500 BC all the way to around 1500 before Michelangelo burst on the scene and was able to replicate and perhaps some would say even exceed the type of, of skill and the type of uh, artwork that's embodied in this sculpture. So the Greeks reached a, a pinnacle of civilization. The Romans copied some things from them, but after that civilization lost an awful lot until the Renaissance uh, started to regain some of that knowledge. Here we have another example of a frieze. This is the detail that's usually at the top of the columns on a Greek temple might have been applied to other buildings as well. Here too you see some of the the emotion and the energy that could be captured by the Greek uh, sculptures. You see here with flared nostrils this horse and uh, going into battle or being led someplace and, and some dramatic scene occurring. You see here once again the way that this the drapery on the body has been artfully at least here. Here it may have been eroded quite a bit and it's not quite the same effect. In fact, it looks like some of the stone has been broken off. But the fact is you, you can see emotion here and you can see energy in the way that this has been captured. So it's not just a matter of the skill in working the stone. 
but it's a matter in the way that the entire thing has been composed by the sculpture. The real artistry begins at that point. Now here we have another vase from the same era, and it's another illustration of how essentially things were loosening up a great deal from the kinds of concepts that the Greeks inherited from the Egyptians. Here we have a scene from the Odyssey where Ulysses is returning and he hasn't yet revealed his identity to anybody in his hometown, but his nurse, who is this person here who's washing his foot, recognizes a mark on his leg and recognizes him and he's cautioning her not to give away the secret because he's got to come back after 20 years and deal with people who have overtaken his possessions and even have made overtures to his wife. So he's planning at this point on how he's going to come back and retake what's rightfully his. But the fact that that sort of a scene out of Greek story is illustrated here shows you how different Greek art is from the art of the Egyptians. And it's that kind of a different purpose for art. Here it's art for decoration and entertainment as opposed to the purpose that the Egyptians had for art. And here we see a tombstone of Hegeso. Uh, presumably this woman is buried under this tombstone. We see here a scene from her life, not for the purpose of preserving her life, as Egyptian art would have been, but here perhaps just to show the nature of her character. This might be a servant who's bringing a box to her from which she's selecting a ring. And the position of her hand is suggestive of her examining this thing that she's holding. So you're seeing something here of a rather dignified person who's got people working for her, more or less. But you also see something else here. The drapery, in terms of how it's draped, to show the shape of the body, the curve of the legs here, without being so obvious as to just show the leg without any covering at all, and how the drapery is hanging very naturally. The Greeks are using their eyes and translating that into stone. But you see something else here, too. Take a look at the way this arm curves down and is echoed in the curve there. And then take a look at the way this is curved, and this is curved, and this curve here. That's part of what the artist was doing who composed this, is curves kind of echoing curves. This seat could have been a straight-legged seat, but he chose to represent it with these curved legs because I think he had something to do with the symmetry of this. And notice that the object that she's looking at is pretty much dead center in this frame. And it's balanced by having one person on one side, one person on the other. That sort of symmetry is something that's going to become ever more important in art as we move into the Roman era and then into the Middle Ages where rules started to be formed in people's minds about how one forms art. So this is a very interesting piece of uh, marble carved to represent a tombstone here for this person who's probably buried under it. And that's the end of the slides. This is the highlights and the main points of the readings in chapter 3.